Yeah. Let's sort of plug your headphones. Okay, in. we're on. I'm just trying to line it up. Good morning. Thank you for joining us Good here morning. at our Flow HQ. We're just having a look at this hive here and seeing if it is time to harvest some honey and how much. Now, looking in the window, it's an interesting sight. What we've got this morning is some condensation and it's something a lot of people do ask about. When we first took the window off 10 minutes ago, the condensation wasn't there. But what happened was this surface cooled down and because we've had weeks and weeks of floods and rains, there's so much moisture around, that when moisture comes in contact with the cool surface, it will condense. Uh, the moisture in the air will condense and form a little water droplet. So that's the condensation you see. And it happens on the windows because they get a bit cooler than the wood, which is more insulating. That's a perfectly normal thing to see if you've got cooler nights and days, along with a lot of moisture in the environment. But this frame, if you can see through that, you can see the bees have eaten some of the capping off and taken some of the honey away. Now that's a sign that they're a little bit hungry and that's no surprise because we've had so much rain the bees haven't actually been out of forage despite some flowers being in bloom, the rain has set them off, but the bees haven't been able to get there. So today the rain has just actually stopped 10 minutes ago, which is nice timing for us and hopefully we'll see the bees deciding it's a good day to get out and do some foraging. If you've got questions, put it in the comments below and we'll get to answering those. But what I th thought we'd talk a little bit about today is how much honey to harvest from your flow hive. So the things to look for when deciding whether to harvest or not and how much is whether the bees are bringing in good nectar and you're also taking a guess at the flowers ahead. So here you can see there was honey in these frames, but they've started to eat them out. When you see a checkered pattern like this, where it's full, 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 empty, empty, full, 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 empty, then that's a sign that they're actually getting a bit hungry. There's a good example of it there. It was all full and they've eaten it out. When they're filling, you see a general filling pattern in all of these empty cells where they're bringing it out like this. So what we're seeing here is hungry bees. So what we don't want to do is harvest too much honey from this hive at the moment. But the flow hives are versatile and they allow you just to harvest a little bit if you want to. So the bees won't miss it if we just take some of one of the frames or even just a, a single frame and leave the rest for the bees. Now around here, you can see that condensation again. For those that are just tuning in, we did talk about condensation earlier. When you've got a cool, uh, conditions, you've got cool weather and that's combined with a lot of moisture around then condensation on the, these windows is normal. They get a bit cooler than the inside of the box. And you can see, I'm not sure if you can see through that, but this is a frame we've harvested a couple of weeks ago and you can see they have stripped it all back, they've used the wax, recycled it to join all the frame parts back together but they haven't filled it up with nectar again. So that's showing us that there's not a nectar flow. They're not bringing in enough nectar to really store honey in the flow frames. So what we're gonna do is set up our little shelf. And as we're doing that, think about any questions you have and we'll answer those while we're harvesting just a little bit of honey. So we've set up our little shelf there like that. We're gonna get a key here and we'll use that to um, open one of these frames. Now, if I get a jar here, I can put that on the shelf. And all we need now is this little tube to go in. So I'm gonna pick a frame here. This one looks like it might be, uh, might have a bit of honey in it. And what we can do is just harvest a small amount now. You might notice this jar, a shelf, is set up down low for a big jar. We thought we might have to, to uh, run away from the rain. But because we're only harvesting a small amount, just part of a frame, I want to use the, the, uh, the jar shelf up in, in this position. So what we need is the little tool to move the shelf. 
and um, then we can wind out some of these screws and move the jar shelf up. If you let it fall that far, it tends to move in the wind if it gets windy and, and dribble down the side of the jar. So I'll uh, answer questions as I go and get some of, uh, get the little tool we need to undo the hive. Any questions coming in, Trace? Oh yeah, so it's just with that condensation on the window, Heidi's wondering, would it create mould in the hive and is mould a problem in the hive? If you get excessive condensation for a, a long time and the bees aren't using that part of the hive, i.e. let's say there's, the, there's not a big enough colony to use the flow frames and you've got condensation that's there for long periods of the time, yes you can get mould. The bees um, will have to put some effort in to clear that out later, but generally bees are pretty good at fixing up an old, old hive and making it their own again. Fantastic. Cedar's just run off to get um, a Another hive question. tool. Cedar, the next question coming in about that, do you ever think that you should paint the inside of the hives? Uh, you don't need to paint the inside. Some beekeepers do. Conventionally, commercial beekeepers will paint the inside, they'll paint the outside, they'll make it last just as long as they can. But it's... Uh, what we tend to do is just leave the inside perfectly natural for the bees. So you can do either but we tend not to. Okay. Any more questions? Yeah, Cedar. So Eric's tuned in. Um, got a brood box that's about 75% drawn out, lots of larvae and seemingly active queen. Am I getting close to putting on the Flow Super? Okay, what you want to see before you put the Flow Super on is all of the combs drawn out. So you want to see the combs actually uh, full with wax all the way to the bottom and then a lot of bees. Now we put a Super on, I think if you dial back two videos with my son on his hive, and you get a good idea of what it should look like when you go to put your Super on. Could you grab the uh, key for us for moving the jar shelf? Jar shelf. Maybe in the basic. Okay, okay any more questions? Thanks, yeah. Brad's asking, just wondering, he's noticed that we're em um, harvesting a half empty flow frame here. Just wondering what's the possibility of bees being in the empty half and would it kill the bees if you were harvesting? So we're harvesting one that's full, but to answer your question, we put a lot of work into making sure that the, that the process of harvesting was as gentle as possible on the bees. And I'll explain a little bit about that. So what we did um, in the beginning is we made hexagons that move like this is some of our first prototypes but What we found is if you did like you're saying have a whole lot of bees down some empty cells when you move the comb parts that um, you Move it like that and that was fine and the honey would flow down but, but if a bee was down there it might put a leg or a wing Through this point here and then when you put it back it could get trapped in the the moving parts so what we did, and we've got a whole patent about this, is we put a, a gap in, in between to allow the bees to bridge the area between the moving parts. So what that means is when you move them, this bit of wax that they've created breaks. And then when you move it back, there's a gap so they can't get caught there. At worst, a bee might get caught in a bit of wax and the other bees will help it out to, to get out of its own wax. So we put a lot of attention into that. So having said that, it's still best to harvest when the, the frames are full, well, close to being full, that is. So um, you've got a lot of capping on the frames and your bees are, uh, have gone through that process of dewatering the, 
the uh, honey getting down below that 20% range and then it's ready to store in your jar on the shelf. If you harvest early and you've got honey that looks quite liquid in the jar, then you'll have to consume that before it starts to ferment, unless you're making honey mead, that is. Great, thanks Cedar. Um, on that, um, talking about the painting of the inside of the hive again, Fabian's asking, what about in terms of the inner cover? Do you ever paint the inner cover in the hive, under the roof? Uh, it's not not a bad idea to paint the upper surface of the inner cover or you could paint the whole inner cover if you want that would that would actually keep the uh, the moisture out of it sometimes they do swell when they get get wet so not a bad idea to paint the inner cover we generally don't but that's probably out of um, just uh, uh, not getting around to it <laughs> <laughs> no. um, so it is, um, if the bees are hungry and needing extra food or syrup or dry sugar, just wondering what's the best way to do it. Um, Interalaeus has popped a homemade jar syrup over the hole of the inner cover, but wondering is there an internal flow hive hardware that does this better? Uh, there isn't. We don't have a purpose built feeder, but we should. Uh, but there, there is feeders you can put under the roof. Now, we rarely have to feed bees in this area. In fact, we, we don't really ever have to because there's always something flowering. But you do get areas in the world that you do. It's a good idea to feed bees because you can find periods where some of your hives will starve out. You're better off feeding them than letting them starve. So, well done. You've created a jar, you've put holes in the lid, you've put syrup in it, you've turned it upside down on top of the inner cover where there's a hole the bees can access it. That works quite nicely. Another uh, thing you can do is just put the syrup in a Ziploc bag and put some pinholes in it and put it up under the roof. That's another, another thing. We've got a, um, a video somewhere on our Facebook uh, streams or YouTube saying how to make a, a quick and dirty feeder. So there's, there's a, a few ideas in there if you want to, want to create your own feeder. There is a round top feeder that fits pretty well. It just sits up just slightly. It's a, it's a round um, bee feeder that goes in that central hole. So you can use that one that you can find out there at beekeeping stores. Great, so Gary's um, tuning in from California and new beekeeper installed a three pound package of bees late April but also used the Flow Hive entrance reducer as um, he'd read that it was best to protect a small colony um, that way but now the temps are getting high and it's getting pretty hot. Just wondering whether they need to remove that entrance reducer or do they wait for the colony to grow? Okay, so the um, generally I don't use the entrance reducers unless I've got an issue of robbing. But when you're, as you say, in a colder climate, generally um, when, the, when the hive gets up and going in the springtime, you'd be taking that entrance reducer away. So what I'm going to do if I just want to harvest half a frame is I'll insert the key just halfway. So if, if, you, if you like, that's all the way. So that's our measurement there. And then you should get a few jars of honey out of just doing half a frame. So I'm turning that now to that 90 position and what we should see is the honey starting to flow down and out this tube. And we're just going to leave the rest for the bees. It's an example of, of um, today we talked earlier about how the, uh, the pattern in these frames show that the bees are a little bit hungry, they're eating some of the cells away. So it's a good idea not to take too much honey, but you still can take a bit if there's honey in the hive and leave the rest for the bees. Oh, it's starting to come. Like your little set up there seeds with your double jar. Yeah, we, uh, we've <laughs> misplaced the little tool that can move the shelf. So uh, we may as well just pile up some jars, that's okay. Perfect. It's good to put it closer to the stream, otherwise the wind blows the honey around. Great, and today we've got Callum behind the, com uh, behind the camera today. He's pretty new and he's doing a great job. Welcome Callum to the team. Um, Cedar Graham's in New Newcastle, New South Wales, and as the weather's cooling, he's checked the brood box, lots of frames of honey, everything's looking good. So wanting to take off the flow super. The flow frames have some capped and uncapped honey in them. 
Just wondering, will it be okay to store them in an airtight container and put them back in spring to give the bees a kick start? Or should he drain the honey and nectar and clean the frames up before spring? Okay, so the very best would probably be to stick them in a freezer. If you have a deep freeze that with enough space in it, you can put your flow frames in the freezer and that will preserve them as they are and you can put them back on in the springtime and they can pick it up from there. If you don't have a freezer, then as you say, it might be a good idea to harvest what's in them and then wait a few days for the bees to clean out the remaining honey out of them and then take them out of the hive, put them in a tub away from vermin and whatnot and then you can uh, put them back on in the springtime. What you don't want to do is leave honey in them and leave it sitting around, especially if you're in a warmer climate, you will get mold and manky honey that you'll have to then clean up come the, the time to put the flow super back on again. Great. Chris is uh, tuned in. Just wondering, taken off the flow hive for winter and as the bees have moved all the honey down into the brood box, they're running two brood boxes two brood boxes. Chris noticed that the first five centimetres of the flow frames seem to have a little bit of mould growing. We seem to have a lot of mould questions at the moment. Yes, yeah, so we had a very wet, got a <laughs> wet time. <laughs> We're in Mouldyville up here. Um, they know the bees will clean them up when the flow is on, but however just sort of juggling with winter locking it down. Just wondering if it's okay to just leave them like that. Will it be okay to then pull them back out in the springtime um, and the bees will clean up that mould or should they clean them first? Okay, look, it depends how bad it is, I guess. If it's looking, looking really um, rough there, then you might want to get out the hot water gurney, which is about the only thing I've found to clean flow frames, is, look at that honey stream, isn't it beautiful? I'm just going to have to swap this jar before I forget. Oh, nice. Very good. Got a yum. beautiful jar of honey there. Yum, yum. Oh, look at it. And uh, yes, so if you do want to give them a clean, then you can use a hot water gurney. Now, hot water gurneys, if you buy them purpose built for that, are an expensive machine, but you can use just a cheap one you get at the, at the hardware store and use a hot water supply that needs to be about um, 70 degrees or so because wax melt temperature is 63 degrees C. So you can, you can sometimes get that off your hot water feed um, before the tempering valve or an easy hack is um, you just get a big tub of hot water that you've, uh, that you've made nice and hot and um, put the intake hose from the gurney into that and then you can spray with nice hot water. Be careful when you're doing all of this but that's the way if you really want to strip the, um, the old wax off a of flow frame. Um, but otherwise, as you said, you know, simply let the bees do it. It's not too bad. Just leave it as it is, put it back on in spring and see how they go. Fantastic. And Cedar, will mould affect the honey? It doesn't seem to because bees won't store in those cells until they've given them a good clean out. So they'll make them their own, they'll coat them all in wax again and store their honey in their own wax. Fantastic. Maybe that's what we need in our houses, a beehive to clean all the mould in our houses. That's right, everyone needs beehives under their pillow, <laughs> under their bed. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> you know, some people uh, breathe bee air. Have you seen those oh. photos that look, look a little bit um, like a... Um, I don't know, a 50s sci-fi film where they've got pipes and things connected to their beehive and a gas mask no. and they're actually sucking air out of their beehive. Obviously you need some sort of filter wow. um, to, <laughs> to, um, <laughs> to make sure you're not breathing in bees. But apparently it's therapeutic to breathe the air from inside a beehive. Well, of the bees. Well, seeds, you might have to add that like a snorkel sort of set up onto the next flow hive four plus. <laughs> <laughs> James is asking, um, James loves the natural wood look of the flow hives and also just saying um, extracted 10 litres of spring honey this year and expecting another harvest at the end of summer. Just wondering, do they need to be painted and stained? Can they stay natural? So the cedar wood, which this hive is, 
can be left just natural and some beekeepers do. It'll go through a phase of looking a bit average as it turns to grey but eventually it'll, it'll go that nice grey colour which I actually quite like. The grey wood look can be quite trendy and the, the wood itself is, is naturally kind of repelling to funguses and things like that so you can do that with the cedar. The Araucaria wood that, that uh, you can also get uh, it needs to be painted with a good quality outdoor house paint. If you want to keep it looking like wood, now you're always battling nature a little bit, it wants to turn wood back into the earth. But if you want to keep looking good like this, we've found that the decking products, they're built for that job, they're built for making a deck look like wood for as long as it can. And that's the, that's the finish you're seeing here, is a decking product. And they're often tinted like this, so you lose a little bit of the natural colours of the wood, but it will give you a longer lasting wooden look. Fantastic. Chuck Rao, who's one of our ambassadors, just tuned in, and it's funny, I've been playing phone tag with him, and he's just said that he's just been speaking to Frey at our office, actually talking about honey harvesting, and he's in the States, and don't you love how that kind of all works out? Round and round and round in circles we go. So nice. Cedar, another question. When you're harvesting the honey, do you have to sterilise the jars? No, unlike preserving jams and things, honey actually is amazing stuff in that it has antibacterial properties, so much so that it gets used in medicine for, for healing wounds that can't actually be healed by anything else. So there's countless stories of people at, at a loss with all of the... Uh, all of the arsenal of everything the hospitals can throw at it but then honey was the thing that actually saved their their leg or whatever they were having trouble with their their wound wow now uh so it will sterilize the jar for you so you don't need to go through a sterilization process fantastic because that's a lot of extra work to do um cedar um mustang has tuned in has Irish black bees and they don't seem to be doing much with the flow frames. They're walking around, you know, chilling out but not really filling the cells. Any tricks to get them started storing into the honey super? Irish black bees, yeah. nice. Uh, nylon like that. Yes, that's right. <laughs> we, we have uh, Niall on our team who's, who's from Ireland. Now, we haven't heard any troubles with Irish black bees, so I think what you're probably seeing is something that a lot of people do experience and that's that annoying time where you're waiting for the bees to build up enough and to, to, for that to coincide with a, a nice nectar flow and then they will store honey in the flow frames. Now if you're getting a bit impatient you can scrape a bit of um, wax off your brood box. If your hive is ready for the super then they've probably put a whole lot of wax on top of the brood frames. You can scrape some off and just mash it into the flow frame surfaced. Do it on the window side so you can enjoy watching them recycle that wax around that local area. And that'll speed up the process of them getting up there and getting started a little bit. But really you won't get much honey stored till you get a, a good nectar flow and a lot of bees when you open the side windows and you're seeing a lot of bees in your hive. And sometimes it's a bit of a patience game Sometimes one hive does amazingly well and other hives really slow, so there can be um, uh, uh, pest issues, disease issues, genetics issues there as well. But generally, patience is what will get you there. Right, Andy's wondering, just spotted, just wondering, is that propolis or wax between the flow frames on the front, the shots that Callum's been showing there? Yeah, that's interesting. They often they tend to use propolis to block up gaps of the hive, but in this case it looks more like wax. Now, if I scrape a little bit off here, I should be able to, to um, smell if it's propolis, because the propolis they collect with a high content of tree resin. So they, they collect the sap off the pine trees, for instance, if you've got pine trees around, and, and the propolis will smell very sappy. But in this case, it is wax they've used to block up the gaps uh, between the flow frames. Clever little bees, they're always making it their own and, and uh, keeping the elements out by sealing everything up with propolis and wax. 
Nice. Cedar, um, um, Tainto is asking, how many hives do we currently have here in our apiary? So there's about 20 or so here in, in this apiary. And I've got another 40 at home. My sister's got another 20. So, and that's just over the hill over there. So there's another 60 over there. Then my father's got some down the valley a little bit here. My brother's got some and, and so on. So I've got a lot of flow hives in the area, but right here uh, at the office, we have about 20. Nice. Um, Grant's wondering, do bees talk to each other? Because they're wondering, like, how do they know where everyone should go to get the flowers? They do. They don't actually talk, <laughs> but they dance mighty well. And it's an incredible thing. And humans have studied honeybees more than any other insect on the planet and actually managed to decode their language. And their language is a, a dance language where you can actually see the patterns and work out which direction they're going and how far they're going to the flowers. And there's a few other things we've worked out as well. No doubt we, we can't understand their complete language yet, but we do understand that if they move in a figure of eight pattern on the comb surface, waggling their tail, then that when they waggle, about one second equals close to, to a kilometre in distance. So if they waggle, then stop, waggle for a few seconds, then stop, that'll be two kilometres away they're going. So somehow the other bees, in amongst 50,000 bees in the dark of the hive, can see that dance and know exactly where to go. And the axis of the figure of eight pattern they're doing tells them the di direction relative to the sun. So amazingly, yes, they can tell the other bees exactly where to go and how far to go and probably a million other things in bee language, but um, they don't talk. Fantastic. Well, that's not quite true. Um, the queen will use trumpeting sounds, so there's an, uh, an audio message and um, she'll do that for a few reasons. One is a bit of a war cry if there's a fight to be had between two queens in the hive. The duelling queens. Cedar, Tiz is asking, what's the, what is the difference between propolis and wax? So wax is excreted from the bee's wax glands, just like we have wax glands in our ears, a bit different. <laughs> um, they can excrete wax and then with their mandibles they use that to make the bulk of the comb. Propolis, on the other hand, is has a high content of tree resin added. So they'll go and collect tree resins from any tree that can find that it has some weeping tree sap and, and bring that back in. And they'll use that for a few reasons. One is to create a different consistency of stuff that they can use for blocking up the, the corners of the hive and any little gaps they have. And the other one is they use it as a high antimicrobial uh, substance so that they will, in, in a log hollow, they'll use a lot to coat the inside of the hollow to, um, to, to keep away things like mould. Some people uh, uh, experimenting in the world, Sealy's done some great work on it, where you rough up the inside of your beehives to promote the bees to, 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 to smooth it out with their propolis and then you get some of that antimicrobial work keeping your beehive uh, with, with less, less pathogens in it, I guess, and it's said to be health benefits. I've tried it a little bit, haven't had that much success. Genetics plays a big role on how much the bees will cover the inside of the hive with propolis. Nice, all that jar's starting to get there, a little bit longer. So for those that are just tuning in, we're talking about just harvesting a little bit of honey today. The question was how much honey should we be harvesting? In this case, we can tell the bees are hungry, so we've just decided to, to harvest half a frame. And right on cue, we've got one hungry bee coming to, to check out the honey behind the hive. And that's something you'll get more often when the bees are hungry, is them looking for anything sweet, whether it be flowers or honey. And what you might find is this bee will get a little taste for it, go back, do a dance inside the hive, tell the rest of the bees that right around the back there's this amazing sweet sauce to go and get. And then you can get a whole pile of rubber bees coming to rob honey. So keep an eye on that when the bees are hungry especially. 
and you might need to cover up your jar with some netting or some kitchen wrap to, to stop that happening. Nice. Just got a couple of people tuning in asking about some of our stock B suits flow keys and probably best to contact customer support on those questions and they'll let you know when all those things are back in stock again. Um, and Sonia's asking, just wondering, is there any plans for a long lang flow hive? Long lang flow hive. So some people are experimenting with going sideways instead of vertical. Advantages of that are once you lift the lid off, you've got access to your brood and your flow frames. I've experimented a little bit with it, haven't had that much luck. Might need to experiment more. Let me know how you go if you want to go stack your boxes sideways instead of um, vertical. Now, the I guess there's some advantages and disadvantages to each. The main advantage is you don't have to lift the honey super off to get to your brood. Disadvantage is it's less like a tree hollow in it's the bees are often naturally more in a vertical column and you've also, um, the, your honey frames might get a bit cooler and more prone to candying in the hive because they're not sitting above the brood nest like this where they're staying warmer. Um, and there's probably a bunch more advantages and disadvantages but um, I definitely promote experimentation if anybody wants to make long hives and put flow frames in them. Let me know how it's going for you. Great, Joshua was saying is the bee drowning? I don't, oh no, look, it's, oh, it's just having a fine old time in there. Well, so bees we'll... will survive a long time just sitting on the top of the honey like that. But what I tend to do is get a little stick. In fact, I can just use this flow key right here and I'll put it back on the landing board just by grabbing it like that. And there I've got the bee. And what I'll do is I'll just go around the front of the hive and I'll drop that bee and the other bees will lick it up real quick. There we go. Whoa! <laughs> it's very muddy around here today. If you come around here, uh, Callum, then you'll see this bee. I'm just going to put it right on the landing board there. And there we go, the other bees, you can see already licking it there, licking it clean. Nice, morning tea for the bees. Mm. What does it taste like, Seeds? Oh, it's a nice, it's a beautiful, how would I describe that? It's almost got that beautiful waxy texture, you know. It's um, getting more and more well known that people love the taste of their flow hive honey compared to uh, the conventional honey or store-bought honey. There's a few reasons for that. One is the zero processing here. It hasn't touched any form of machinery to get into your jar. It's only gravity that's manage to um, get it out of your hive and into the jar. So as we know, the more processed your food, the more flavour you lose. The other one is it hasn't um, been spun in a centrifuge and, and, uh, and been in contact with so much oxygen. Oxygen is known to actually um, dissolve some of those fine floral essences and you lose the sort of upper palate flavour bursts of your honey. Um, and the other one is you're isolating frame by frame. If we harvest this frame over here, we might find that it's a completely different flavour. And as you know, when, if you mixed all your ingredients in your kitchen together, then you would get something that was a bit average in flavour or a bit of a, might still taste okay, but it's a bit of a blend of everything. It might be more enjoyable to taste the different flavours. So we get sort of rave reviews on Flow Hive Honey for those reasons. And here we've got that beautiful flavour that, I, it's hard to describe, but it's like when you crunch into a fresh piece of honeycomb. Somehow um, it tastes like comb honey. Nice. Um, Cedar, Bill's asking, how many, how many supers do you always have on your hives? I generally just put one on top, but some people like to put more supers on their hive. Some people like to put more brood boxes. There's a few reasons why I do one, and it's partly because the nectar flows in this area tend to be just uh, come and go throughout the year, and we don't really need to have massive sized colonies. So it's a, just a bit easier to manage when you have one super and one brood box. If you're looking for the queen, you only need to look through the eight frames in the bottom here. 
if you're taking a box off, you only need to take one box off the top, and, and, and so on. So, so uh, for that reason, we just keep it in this configuration, but by all means, if you want to buy another super or another brood box, you can. And in some areas where you've got a really long um, season, where, uh, for instance, perhaps up in Canada, um, where the season, sorry, is compressed. So you've got a long winter, and then maybe four months where everything's flowering at once. They tend to stack uh, many boxes for that to, to allow the bees to build up to a really large sized colony because everything's flowering at once for months and months in a row and that allows the bees really to build up bigger. So in those areas you might decide to add more supers on your hive or maybe more brood boxes as well. So go for a bit of local knowledge. There's a little bit of a dif difference with flow hive harvesting. Now in conventional beekeeping you'd add more supers because you want to batch process the whole lot. It's so, such a lot of work and such a big sticky mess to clean up and all of that, that when you um, go to do it, you just want to get a lot of boxes done at once and get it over and done with. So what you tend to do is store the honey on the hive in boxes and then take all of those boxes off and process the whole lot together. Yeah. Now, we can do it a bit differently here. We can store our honey in jars on the shelf and allow the bees to keep going. Because it's so easy just to harvest as you go, you can then keep harvesting, store the honey on the shelf in jars instead of in boxes on your hive. So there's a bit of a different thought pattern there, but it doesn't matter which way you go. You can also store honey in more flow frames if you want to. The advantage of that is you've got a, a bigger colony, your hive will be less likely to swarm and and so on. I tend to run the hives a bit smaller and then just split them as they build up because if you don't want another hive, somebody else surely will. Great, Cedar. Uh, 3D printing props is saying, um, got some brown stuff floating in there, honey. Should they filter that out? I don't know what the brown stuff is. Okay, so sometimes you can get a bit of a build up of um, a few different things in the trough area. This one looks pretty clean. This one actually needs a clean out. It's got some honey that's gotten in there and stayed in there too long. We haven't cleaned it out. And it um, looks like it's fermented in there. So we'll clean that one out. But you can get, um, can get a situation where, as the bees are repairing the comb, a whole lot of wax falls through into the trough area down here. You get a harvest and that comes out into your jar. Typically, all you need to do is put is set your jar down for a day or so, it all floats to the top and you can skim it off. That's all I would ever do. But some beekeepers like to sieve their honey because back in the days when I was extracting in conventional ways, there was a lot of post-processing you had to do to get a clear jar of honey. And there was, there was sieving and filtering and settling and all of that. What I find with the flow hive is it's pretty much ready to go at at worst, as you say, you might get a couple of little bits of brown wax or propolis or something floating to the top of the jar and you can just skim that off if you want to. Right, see, so Melissa's asking, um, down in the Hunter Valley, the brood box is nice and full, but of course it's coming on to winter here in Australia. Just wondering, um, should, they, should she hold off on putting on the flow frames till summer or do I put them on anyway if the brood box is nice and full? Okay, if the brood box is nice and full, Hunter Valley, you, you might want to wait now. There's probably, we're, we're just around the corner, a few days out from winter time here. And you'll, f you'll find in that area, you'll probably not get much honey through the winter. But ask around just in case you do. We do get honey through the winter here. So if you were in our location, you'd put the put the box on just as you saw me doing with my son a couple of weeks ago on the live stream. But in the Hunter Valley you're a bit further south, um, you're possibly going to not get much over the winter time so you might be better off just leaving the bees as they are and putting on your super. Um, probably in the last month of winter because you probably find the flowers burst out at the end of winter. 
Great. Sita, you'll understand this one, I'm sure. Charles is asking, in two years has produced about 70 gallons of honey, all from full frames. The water content is always between 21 to 23. It won't go below 20 very often. Is that normal to always produce above 21? Okay, it'd be interesting to know. Uh, well done on your honey production, by the way. Um, be interesting to know. Um, a few things. One would be to cross-reference with another refractometer to really make sure uh, that, that you haven't got a calibration issue. But normally, you no, know, the bees will, will get it down below the 20% range. You will get bees that get a little bit lazy and they just can't be bothered getting that last um, bit down. And bees that do that, you'll sometimes even see fermentation starting in the frames, in the hive. But I'd be interested to know um, if you get another refractometer whether you um, are still seeing the honey um, at the, above the 20% moisture content. Now, the danger for everyone about this is if you store honey that's got a too high moisture content, it can start to ferment in the jars. So I'd also be interested to know whether any of your honey on the shelf has uh, started to ferment, you should see little bubbles forming in it and uh, that sour taste if you do get fermentation occurring. Great. Cedar, Mr Kalani's asking, is it true that bills will, bees will kill their queen? It is true that bees will kill their queen. Now, one of the reasons they might do that is if she's not performing. In our language, queen means the ruler and you certainly wouldn't be killing the queen. In a beehive, she gets called the queen, but she's not the ruler. She is still, uh, I guess, she's the egg layer. <laughs> and and um, she, if she's not doing a good enough job, then for the survival of the colony, the bees might bump her off and raise a new queen. So. That's the, I guess, the brutality of it. And, but it also brings about an interesting question and that's who makes the decisions in the hive? And it seems that it's a kind of a, a, a group consciousness, if you like, where decisions are being made collectively as a super organism, not any one bee making the decision. Great, Cedar, um, Silvani's asking, is in Melbourne, um, and which is south and quite cold here in Australia. One of the highs have, has two brood boxes and it's got the super flow frames on the top. Yesterday checked and the flow frames, three of them look like they're full of honey, but it's starting to get cold down there at night. So just wondering should they remove the flow frames and pack it down or leave the flow during winter? Um, what are your thoughts on that? So if you've got two brood boxes, as I understand, that's correct, right? Yep, that's right. Two yep. brood boxes, flow frames on top, half of them are full. Now, what you could probably do is harvest the honey in the flow frames, wait, wait a few days for them to, to, to lick all of the remaining honey away, and then take that box off for the winter. And then you'll be left with your two brood boxes, which should have enough honey stores on the edges of those for your hive to survive the winter. Now we're, we're almost overflowing this jar Whoa. here. So, <laughs> so we've got a pretty textbook harvest here. We usually get six or, or seven flow fr uh, jars from one frame. And here we've filled up three, uh, three frames from half, uh, three jars from half a frame of honey. Now, that's a, um, it's, it's a beautiful thing and something you can do with a flow hive easily is just harvest a little bit and leave the rest for the bees. So that's what we've done today. We've just harvested half a frame by inserting the key just halfway in. And we're doing that to illustrate the point that you can do that, but also that the bees are a little bit hungry at the moment. We can tell that by looking in the windows and seeing what's going on. So we could pack up this harvest now. We've got our three jars of honey to take home to the family and the, it's a beautiful honey too. Nice. So what we can do is, um, I'll just show you quickly what we need to do to end the harvesting process. Now I just put that key in the mud, so I'm gonna wipe that mud off the key. And now all I'm gonna do is there's two slots here 
if you have a look, there's an upper one and a lower one at the top of your frame. So we were harvesting by putting the key in the bottom one. Now we move it to the top and just push it all the way till you feel a knock at the back and then move it to a 90. That's all you need to do to reset the frame parts. Now, good idea to leave the key in there in that 90 degree position for a minute or so. And what that does is make sure your parts are getting pushed down in the proper position to form hexagons. If you just do a little quick close and move on, you might find the propolis and wax is, is kind of springy and those parts will bounce back up and then you'll be in the situation where your parts are out of line and that could cause problems and spillage inside the hive downstream. So just leave your key in for a bit longer like that after harvesting when you're closing up to finish off. Nice. Cedar so James has sort of mentioned, and, and we're obviously Flow Hive's very aware of this, that there's lots of sort of cheaper knockoffs on Amazon and eBay. Just wondering, I guess, what is the main difference between those flow frames and the flow frames that the, are actually the true blue real flow frames? Okay, yes, there's, um, since the beginning we've had, uh, in fact, all the way from crowdfunding, we were, we were doing our crowdfunding and even just before we delivered our first hive, there was cheap knockoffs coming out of China. And it's something that's um, been a, a, an issue, I guess, all the way. And also a lot of people, and it's still happening today, will sell um, uh, flow hive copies and take your money and not even deliver the hive. So there's a lot of that going on as well and we're constantly working to shut those down. It's a sad thing. Um, wish they'd stop targeting us, but anyway. Uh, so it's a lot of work we put into trying to clean up the space from um, the cheap and nasty knockoffs and the, uh, the scammers who are just uh, basically collecting your credit card details to then sell on to other people. Now, um, when you talked about the differences, we have actually ordered some of the knockoffs and we've tested them and in some cases we've, we've not even been able to use them. The mechanism wasn't built well enough to actually harvest honey at all. So we've sat there and gone, well, it doesn't work so we don't have to worry about it. But we do worry about it because we don't really want people out there with all of these um, copies of our invention We've got our patents in place and all of that, but it's, it's hard to stop um, coming out of China. And uh, it's, yeah, so what can you do? But we, um, we, we do work hard to try and stop the, the scammers and the um, knockoffs. Yeah, totally. And I think I've even had a few this week calling from the States. Um, always best to, as we say, check honeyflow.com, our website, and just call us and know that you can talk to a person and we can tell you that we are the Flow Hive people. Cedar, what's the shelf life of honey? So that's a, an, an amazing thing of honey. So this jar, if the lid was good enough, and the moisture content was low enough, which it looks like it is, it's, it's nice, nice honey in there today, could last thousands of years without going off. And they know that because they've found honey in pots in the Egyptian tombs. So honey was used, back then it was a very revered product and it was used for embalming, it was used as a gift to, to, to the gods and things like that and left in pots and um, they've, they've found 3,000 year old honey that is still good. Now it will go candied, but that's still good honey. Candied honey is good honey. And it's important to know that it doesn't always look like this. And uh, eventually all honey will go candied, which means it forms sugar crystals and it sets. And that's beautiful honey too. It's just a different experience. My kids love it and they call it the crispy honey. So another amazing property of honey, not only does it have amazing healing properties, but it can also last for thousands of years. <laughs> How amazing is that? Um, so I'm not quite sure what Corrie Mark's question is here, but basically they're in Pennsylvania 
Um, oh, where have you gone? There. Been trying to catch a swarm, hasn't had any luck. How long before I should buy a nuke? Now, I'm not sure if they mean they've got the hive. I'm not quite sure what that question is, but maybe we could talk about the difference between a swarm and nuke. So, well done for wanting to catch a swarm, but it's something that may or may not happen. If you're right near a hundred hives in an apiary and it's springtime, then you'll increase your chances dramatically. But if you're just waiting for a swarm, it could take many months, you might not find one that season. Getting on the Facebook groups and things will help. Somebody might alert you to a swarm and you can go and catch it. But generally, the easiest way, as you say, to get started in beekeeping is with a nuke. So you go to a bee breeder and you buy a box of bees, which is usually half the size of one of these boxes. So half the size of this lower box here. And it's an already going thing with uh, with frames that are all built out, there's a queen laying, there's honey stores, there's pollen stores, there's brood, it's, it's all happening and all you need to do is get in your bee suit, get out your smoker, transfer them into your bottom box, look after them and they'll grow from there. There's a few other ways to get going, uh, you can also buy a package which is like an artificial swarm and you can also take a split which is a, uh, where you take half the frames out of a bottom box here and transfer them to another box. So that's another way to get going. If you know somebody with a hive, especially in the springtime, you can actually be doing them a favour by taking some of their frames out, reducing the likelihood of that hive swarming, and you can also uh, start your own colony from those frames, provided there's either e eggs or really young larvae on them to raise a queen from, or if there's not, or perhaps you just want to anyway, you might introduce a new queen from a queen breeder and, uh, and you can get going like that. So a few different ways there to take a split. If you have a look at the beekeeper.org, there's uh, an amazing course there made to take you from square one right through to a, even a deep scientific knowledge in beekeeping. It gets rave reviews. It's also a fundraiser. This year we're planting a million trees from the funds from, from the beekeeper.org. We're very excited about it. Experts from all over the world tuning in, a really good online course. But otherwise, we've, if you Google around and have a look at our, our videos, our YouTube channel, Facebook feed, then you'll find um, a lot of information there as well on how to do splits and how to get started in beekeeping and the different ways to get started. So we've got time for one more question. Oh great, look, and I just want to give you a little positive feedback story to end on from Graham, who's uh, never been able to join f um, live Facebook before, but having now got COVID, is required to isolate, and is loving actually watching all the lives and having his question answered. And just thanks for all the support that you give to new novice back backyard beekeepers, and just sort of saying they would never have ventured down a path without the invention of the flow hive seats. Ah, excellent. Great to, great to hear your stories and, and excellent that the Flow Hive has inspired you to get started. I had COVID recently too, so uh, my thoughts are with you there as you go through that isolation and hopefully you don't get too sick. Um, but yeah, I'm, I've, uh, that was a few weeks back and I'm all good again now. So uh, hopefully you will be too. And the best of luck with your bees going forward. And thank you very much for tuning in. And if you um, do have anything you want us to cover, we're always up for talking about new topics. Sometimes if you dial back to last week, uh, we were inside a hive checking out this and that in there uh, and, and having a look at what was going on inside the hive. So often it's a, a show and tell about how to do something in beekeeping. Other times it's just um, more general Q&A. So um, please come back, tune in, also let us know what you'd like us to cover. And it's a great thing that we see is people helping each other. So you might notice a lot of comments in the thread below. Scan through. If you know the answer, then chime in. It's all about helping each other get started in this wonderful pursuit of beekeeping.